I wanted to talk to you about um, some of the work that I do um, when coming up with ideas or ways in which I help uh, companies, organizations, and others uh, think about uh, the marketplaces, the marketplaces of the future, and, um, and come up with ideas, uh, ideation techniques. I am a foresighter, so that means I think about how to think about the future. So that's what I do. Uh, any other foresighters in the room here? Yes, 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 yes. Good. Um, I am, as you can see, um, also coming from OCAD University. I'm a professor of innovation there. I teach in uh, two graduate study programs. One of them is the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program, uh, which Gabe knows very much about, and also uh, the Digital Futures uh, Program. So. One is dealing with thinking about technologies of the future, and the other one is uh, general uh, thinking about wicked problems, changes in society, and ways to intervene on these systems. So foresighting is a tool for both of those. I also work um, in two labs there. One is called the S-Lab. Some of you may or may not know it. It's uh, uh, the Strategic Innovation Lab uh, at OCAD, and also something called the Super Ordinary Lab, which I'm a founder of, which is specifically looking at technologies, how to break, extend, and create new things with them. I do these kinds of exercises around the world. Um, I have done it in Oslo at the University of uh, Architecture and Design um, with the World Youth Summit with, at Europe, with young producers around the world, and I'm actually about to go on a three-day stint uh, with AT&T Labs. Uh, to do the kind of exercise I'm doing with you, but over three days. So you're lucky, you're only gonna have to do it for 20 minutes. So, so it's, it's interesting, and, and labs, research labs, which is where some of, where I learned how to do this, um, is uh, a great place for these kinds of games and these kinds of exercises. So what are we gonna do? Um, I'm gonna try to do a quick presentation as fast as I can. Um, and then we're going to do a quick exercise. So we're going to be bodies in motion. Uh, it's probably time to get up and lose the PowerPoint, which I was so willing to do anyways. Um, and we're going to create, we're going to look at trends. We're going to identify trends together, things which are changing in society around us. And those are particular to or might have an impact on the mobile space, but not exclusively looking at, uh, at mobile or portable technologies. Um, we're going to develop a response to that really quickly. Here's Here's what's changing, so what? Why do I care? And what kind of idea will, does that give me uh, in terms of market opportunity? Um, and we're going to report back. Uh, I'm going to do some concluding remarks and talk to you about if you're going to do this at home, um, what would your next steps be? I hope that you will have an appreciation for trend identification, although I have no control over whether or not you're going to appreciate it. Um, and, um, and you might uh, be able to track and develop your own trends in your own companies and organizations, um, and also understand how to uh, leverage these things within uh, the market. When we talk about trends, oftentimes people ask me, well, what's the difference between a trend and a fad? Um, and they, they are different. Um, Perhaps this can be seen of, um, uh, to be explained that a fad it might be a very short-term um, movement. Um, in terms of this, is in terms of the vernacular of foresighting work, um, it it might be something like people are suddenly color is back, right? Like my blue scarf. Suddenly, bright red seems to be back in fashion, right? Like that's a fad, right? We don't expect that in five years' time that same red scarf is going to have the same kind of panache. Um, you won't think I have the same kind of design sense or, or with itness in five years' time if I'm still wearing that scarf. Um, and the way that I work with my gloves, it probably won't last beyond um, next week. So you can think of fads as much more short term, um, but we can use fads to think about what that might signify. Like the color red coming back uh, might have a cultural import. It actually might mean something about society and our values and what's happening right now. So it's, it means something. You know, and, and the job of the foresighter, um, we don't exclusively look at fads, but when you think of fads, you ask yourself, what does this mean? This means something. I don't know yet. What does it mean? And that's oftentimes the process of this entire journey. A trend is usually a longer term uh, thing. Um, it's made up of signals, and those are evidences that things are changing. Now, in this really dynamic, chaotic, um, unorganized world, uh, we have to forge um, order into it by identifying patterns of change and we have to call them into being. It's a little biblical. You have to call things into being by naming them, 
right? Because things aren't organized in patterns around us. So what we do is we look for signals of change and we organize those into units of change which are called trends. And so what would be an example of a trend? Uh, maybe the rise of crowdsourced funding, for example, is a, is a trend that we're seeing right now. Because they're based on evidence and what's happened, they actually are historical. We're saying, oh, this change is happening. So we're anticipating that it's going to keep moving into the future. But how does it move into the future? There's this notion of an underlying driver, something which has a current which is moving it uh, forward. And these are much deeper, more longer term um, movements in society. So um, the drivers of uh, coordinated social collectivity uh, might be a theme that we might think about. What is this a driver that's forcing many trends in, in motion? Um, so those are layers. Uh, it's really, oh. Oh, okay. So these are the layers. Uh, signals are uh, instant or short term. And they can be events. They can be policy decisions as well, um, which might mean something. You know. And those things, when we try to understand what pattern it's creating, become the trends, uh, which can be on a five to eight year period or potentially longer. But it's hard to find evidence of something that's moving beyond that time frame and still be credible. Uh, your drivers are usually longer term, which means they started a lot earlier as well. Um, we're going to do this together. We're going to develop signals, trends, and drivers really quickly. Um, drivers, so an example of a driver might be, and in the technology space, there are some standard ones. Uh, miniaturization, connectedness, and uh, popularization are things which tend to move the diffusion of technology uh, and its form um, over long periods of time, right? So server farms going into my pocket, right? That's an example of miniaturization. So this is... It's too easy. It's an iceberg, right? So, but the idea, you can see that kind of, and I didn't want to show it too, too brightly because I, it's a little cheesy, but we talk about the iceberg. So the signals are things you can see. They're evidence that you can point to. And so actually, this exercise is an evidence-based inquiry, even though you have to have a creative mind around it. Um, so the signals are things that you can see in terms of the iceberg. They're the tip. The boat can see it. Those are the things out there. We can all point to it. And we can usually agree that they're out there. Uh, the trends are uh, the pattern that you see within it. And uh, the interpreter is the foresighter or a collectivity of people coming together to identify those patterns. And the drivers are really the thing which is pushing this thing in terms of the deep currents uh, forward. Uh, there's a project, uh, 2020 Media Futures, which Kathleen was deeply embedded in, as well as Gabe. Uh, was anyone else involved in 2020 Media Futures? It was for the uh, digital and creative cluster within Ontario. We did this kind of work with them. Um, I developed a trend deck with Scott Smith, uh, we, which, where we identified a number of trends on a five-year timeline. And when I say five-year timeline, what does that mean? That means the anticipation is that it will have an impact um, in terms of mass adoption or um, it'll come to hit society within five years. And the question we usually ask in foresighting is, how big is this and when is it going to hit? So when you say your trends are on a five-year horizon, you're anticipating a greater uptake or impact of that phenomenon in a five-year uh, time frame. So these are some of the trends. Um, toxic technology, visualizing the world. Uh, these, there are categories within a framework which is standard in the field, which is to think about what's the external environment. How do we understand this is, again, pattern forming? How can we understand the external environment under which we're operating our businesses and organizations? And those things come to have an effect on what we do. And particularly when we're coming for market opportunities, but also um, if an organization isn't looking or scanning, doing a horizon scan around it, the land around it shifts. And organizations have to be very uh, nimble to respond to it. So the social, technological, um, economic, environmental, political, and values framework is one that we use to think about what's the external environment made up of. I also uh, did this work with uh, Nokia. Uh, someone once told me you should never tell people that you were part of corporate strategy of Nokia. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not very becoming. Um, but, but I was. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that work. So I was leading um, uh, the foresight practices uh, in corporate strategy at Nokia uh, around 2004 and 2005. I left Disneyland because I had kids and I wanted to be an academic because it was more mom-friendly. Um, but this work was and spread proselytize 
to everybody about the goodness of foresetting. Uh, and that's what I'm doing right now. So this is my previous life. Um, and we similar, similar work, a different kind of division here for the company, uh, user, uh, user trends, uh, business trends, technology trends, macro trends, which are um, the uh, political, economic uh, environment largely, um, and disruptions. Uh, when, when you see trends coalescing around an, an area or an issue, chances are it's very strong and it's going to disrupt the status, status quo. It's considered a disruption. Those are the ones, if you pay attention to anything, pay attention to where, the, where things are coalescing, because they're the ones with, uh, that are the biggest and are going to have the highest impact on you, right? So how big is it and how fast is it moving? Disruptions can move quite fast and uh, hit hard. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to do, is, um, is outlining, um, trying to think about what are the signals and trends, and uh, putting them on a timeline. So these things begin uh, in the past and they move forward into the future. We can um, use evidence-based inquiry to think about what's happened in the past, um, but we don't know what the future is and there are no facts about the future. So we have to extrapolate or guess what do we think is going to be happening uh, into the future state. So these are timelines I do around the world and it's interesting to compare them from different cities because um, the difference actually is notable. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, what are the signals and trends which these signify um, on a timeline and then think about what does that mean for us. So this, although beautiful, um, it's not really that usable, right? But I'm going to show you how to start using this data later. You have to condense again uh, and identify patterns within it. So again, you know, this is, this is a project in making sense of the very thick present we live in, which is the exclamation mark. I live in the present. You know, I, can, I have some ideas about what happened in the past, and my project is to understand what's happening in the future. And to do that, I have to go back in history to understand what the inertia and forces of change actually are, which are going to lead me into the next minute. Right? So this is the framework. Uh, you don't have to memorize it. I'm going to write it out for you because we're going to work with it. Um, so let's go.